live custom online. So we're live. I have nothing to add. <laughs> So can you just answer the page? You can try with small genomes. Yeah, yeah, I've tried this with like a very virus genome, very small, then like it finishes in 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah but that's the... And the, the difference between like W1 and, and the, like, like, right. the window size, the little minimizers is insignificant for a small one. But as I thought, like, can it you might check? Be it's, a big it's, it's expected. Yeah. If, if you're in W1, it takes long. Okay, okay, so okay, that makes sense. Because I was very confused. All right. Hello, everyone on YouTube and Zoom. Because I have a few people in the, in, in the room physically attending today. So, today we're talking about Row Hammer. This is a seminar in computer architecture lecture, lecture four specifically. Uh, normally, Professor Mutu presents his uh, slides. He talks about the story of Row Hammer. It's a very long story for him. He started working on these issues. I think almost in 2013, but I joined the story a bit late, uh, around 2022. So I'll do my best to explain his part of the story and then catch you up with the most recent developments. So we'll start with this uh, bridge analogy. We see this is a bridge, that's obvious. How reliable, secure, safe is this bridge? That's an important uh, thing to basically understand. And we've been building bridges as like, humans for a long time, but arguably we still cannot make them secure or safe, safe so that people's lives are still somehow in there. So we use this analogy to, um, to, for the program a bit flips because essentially it's also a reliability issue just in another domain. And you can uh, think of the bit flips, program bit flips in DRAM as uh, bridges collapsing. And this is something we certainly want to avoid so that we don't have, uh, we don't lose life. And again, how secure are these people? Uh, if they get a bit flip in this uh, metal bar they're sitting on, they won't be happy. So they're not, maybe they're not very really secure. And security is about preventing unforeseen consequences. And we might have self driving, fully self driving cars in the future that might look like something other than this. But basically, we will have the end in those cars, perhaps, and we will probably want the cars to be safe. And that means we likely don't want to throw hammer bit flips or a way to call it. Yeah. Um, so what's draw hammer? Draw hammer is a phenomenon where one can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. And back when Professor Muklu and uh, Safari Research Group worked on this issue for the I guess the first time, it, more than 80% of the DRAM chips they tested were vulnerable to raw hammer. And it's the first example of, a, um, of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread, uh, widespread system security vulnerability. And then some articles, I, I think back in, yeah, so this, was, this is an article from 2016. It says, forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics, referring to raw hammer bit flops, essentially. Uh, this all essentially is a Rohammer is a is an instance of a DRAM um, reliability issue, and DRAM suffers from these reliability issues or uh, suffers from errors uh, increasingly as uh, we scale memory, uh, we scale technology, so we scale technology down to you know, um, um, lower feature size. And this is a paper Professor wrote early on, and he discusses some of these challenges there. And this scaling is one of the challenges mainly discussed there. And I think this is what initiated the um, memory error research in the group. And so let's look at the scaling problem in a bit more detail. Uh, DRAM, this is a DRAM cell, and you see some circuitry that connects it to other components that allows it to, us to essentially read this cell or update the value of the cell uh, in this diagram. And a cell stores charge in a capacitor. Uh, basically, you encode data um, as charge in the capacitor. And if, if, if the cell is charged, it stores a logic one, for example. And if it's not charged, it stores a logic zero value. 
And uh, essentially, this capacitor, so what are the scaling problems? What are the scaling charges? Uh, these capa capacitors must be large enough for us to reliably sense the charge level in that capacitor. And the access transistor should be large enough uh, for low leakage and retention time. And there are many other components that lie in the path of the, basically that allow us to access or manipulate the data in the cell that all have scaling issues. And back in 20, 2000, uh, sorry, 2009, uh, ITIS in the roadmap they developed, uh, they say that scaling beyond 40 to 35 nanometers feature sizes uh, will be challenging for the young. But now uh, um, I think we went beyond that and we're still scaling the uh, So the capacity cost and energy power are hard to scale all at the same time. And this is one paper, uh, one, one work that, again, uh, some of the Safari research group did in the past, uh, they collected. So this is basically showing as memory scales have become vulnerable. And this is data collected from all Facebook servers worldwide around the uh, years, I think, 2014. And what this plot is showing, essentially, is as chip density increases on the x-axis, the relative server failure rate uh, also increases. So it's like quadratic increase in capacity results and increase in uh, this relative sort of failure rate metric that you see here. For details, I would like you to read the paper and uh, see how this uh, metric is constructed. And yeah, this was a large scale analysis at a, I, I would say a, at a high level, like a system level. And to understand why these failures occur, we, we use infrastructures uh, that I showed you here. Um, one thing we use, so basically this data testing infrastructure allows us to understand these errors at uh, more detail. And this is one of the infrastructures that uh, in the past we used to understand draw hammer bit hooks. And uh, so basically these are different components of this infrastructure. Now I won't talk about details uh, of the infrastructure itself, but this is soft and see another version of that infrastructure that we in the past used to characterize the DDR3 chips. Um, and you can find more details about it here. And it's open source. And this is a newer version of it that we use today to characterize DDR4 chips. Uh, and HDM chips, actually. So it supports already these five things. So we use different FPJ boards to test DDR models. Essentially, that would go into it too much deeper. Uh, and we use these to uh, characterize data retention failures in the past. Uh, so this is from 2012. Uh, basically, data is stored as charge in a VM uh, cells capacitor, and this charge leaks over time. And you need to refresh this charge back by, for example, accessing that VM cell uh, to maintain data integrity. Uh, so we, in the past, for example, the research group uh, worked on this data retention profile. Uh, 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 worked on data retention profile in, the, in real DR chips. And what they found is like the retention time profile of the DRM looks like this. This is showing you essentially the fraction of uh, DRM cells, like Victoria, that have a retention time of 64 milliseconds, more than 128 milliseconds, and, and more than 256 milliseconds. And the key thing here is basically most cells can retain data for a longer time. And if you care about the power, for example, you can um, profile with the on chip. And one thing I didn't mention that was really crucial is today, uh, so this chip, for example, um, will be refreshed at 64 milliseconds, according to the stand. Now we're wasting, essentially, and refreshing takes uh, power, and a refresh operation costs some sort of latency in the command, in, in the DRAM bus. Um, so it had overheads. Now, if you could profile a real chip and find the find that the large majority of the cells require, don't require such frequent refresh operations. You could save power and uh, shave the overheads essentially of refresh operations. Uh, but uh, it's not very easy to figure out the retention time of a DRM cell because uh, this retention time is location dependent, like the physical location of the cell. And it, uh, there's data dependency issues like you write, maybe you write around the cell uh, a pattern of all zeros, you get a retention time of 64 milliseconds. When you write 
all once you get the retention time that's 128 milliseconds. So this is data pattern uh, dependent. And also over time, we will uh, see that maybe a cell that uh, belongs in this blue region here uh, will fall into the, the orange region, 128 to 256 milliseconds, sort of randomly over time. So this is very challenging to actually come up with the profile and be sure that uh, the retention time of a cell will remain as the one you profiled it. And uh, this paper talked about uh, the, you know, the, the um, performance improvements and energy improvements you could gain by applying this, uh, the ideas that you have developed with the refresh uh, profiling study that you did. Um, and then this study, uh, basically this study shows that it's not so easy to do because it's, these failures uh, are dependent on data and time. And there are other uh, um, analyses or characterization studies that we have done in the past using this sort of in infrastructures. Um, and I'm just flashing with some of them here, but I won't talk about them in too much detail. This is just what this infrastructure allowed besides program testing, basically, to give you an example. And more recently, uh, we have done some studies on ECC error correcting codes that also have an effect on um, on profiling rather than the profile, uh, the re retention time profile of the cell that ECC makes, uh, especially on by ECC that's um, essentially hidden from the user by the manufacturers, makes retention profiling a bit more tricky because your errors will be obscured by some error correction capability inside the DRM. And we have also dealt with uh, uh, the basically the ECC, ECC in, inside the chips, and we discuss how to do uh, retention time profiling uh, in presence of ECC in these papers. Okay, uh, if you are interested in this, I refer you to this talk of Professor Mukul if you're interested in data retention and memory refresh. But uh, otherwise, I'll go back to program. So. Rohammer is a curious phenomenon. And uh, basically you have this plot, this diagram showing you um, how DRAM cells are organized. So you have many DRAM rows and each DRAM row is activated essentially by a, a word line cell. And to access a cell, you need to basically open or activate the word line uh, that this cell uh, corresponds or belongs in the, the role that this cell belongs in. And then if you want to access another cell in a different role, you need to close this role or pre-charge the, uh, the bank or um, essentially set the word like low voltage to a low value. If you do this repeatedly, if you uh, raise the word line voltage and reduce it very frequently repeatedly, we find that there will be bit flows in the neighboring uh, uh, rows, in the cell in the neighboring rows. And um, I'll try to explain at a at high level, obviously I won't go into too much detail why this happens in the upcoming slides, but this is something that clearly shouldn't happen. There's no, uh, no like no, comp no competing model or no specification tells you, okay, if you activate the row this many times, there will be bit flows in the neighboring rows. So be careful about this. this is, unspecified behavior shouldn't happen. And we call this row that's repeatedly activated the hammered row. And the the cell that the, the rows that have uh, exhibit bit flips as victim rows. And this is telling you what row hammer is. Uh, this paper, flipping bits in memory that I uh, show you on the bottom, basically analyzed or characterize the raw hammer vulnerability of uh, many DRAM modules from uh, three major manufacturers uh, back in 2014. And they found that most DRAM modules are vulnerable to raw hammer failures. And you see the fraction of the um, raw hammer vulnerable modules for each uh, major manufacturer here. And this is showing you basically that recent DRAM chips back then we're more vulnerable to raw hammer. As you see on the x-axis, we have uh, the modules manufacturing date, and the y-axis shows you the number of errors, essentially. And uh, all modules from 2012 to 2013 
who are vulnerable to raw hammer mitosis, meaning that they exhibit raw hammer errors. And you can see that the first appearance of the error started around 2010 or 2010. Why is this happening? So at a high level, DRAM cells are getting closer to each other. So they're not electrically isolated from each other when you look at the, uh, the chip. And one, like accessing one cell can affect the value in nearby cells. This, is, this can happen due to electrical interference between cells themselves or uh, the wires that are used that to, uh, to access the cells. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling. And one example is when you activate a word line or like apply high voltage to a rope, you actually and activating, slightly activating an adjacent row. And vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row can uh, lose their charge a bit. And if you do this operation repeatedly and frequently enough before those rows are refreshed, victim rows are refreshed, you can use pit force. But again, uh, there are many, um, many components to this failure mechanism that, uh, that are too low level, and I won't go into detail. Uh, the higher level implications are um, because these errors happen in DRAM, now they're visible to the user. And maybe more importantly, um, one user can induce these bit flips. And uh, basically, that's a threat for the security, the reliability of your system. And those will become more apparent as I yeah, discuss further. Uh, so what's that program that can induce these errors? So it looks something like this. It's a very simplified version. You have a system where, you have, where your CPU accesses the theta module, and you're running the, the code that is uh, shown in the bottom left corner here in the CPU. Basically, it has two pointers to two different rows, X and Y. And it loads from row X and loads from row Y to some register, and then flushes these cop the copies of these uh, rows from its caches. So that means uh, the mole instruction will uh, activate the row once. The activation of row i will also cause row x to close. And then later flushing these back in the same order will activate those two rows again. Yeah, so the key idea is of the CL flush instructions, uh, you want to avoid caches, so you um, flush the rows or the cache lines that correspond to X and Y, and you avoid all hits to X, and to do that, you're accessing the other row. So this will um, result in an activation pattern like the one I showed you over there, and in just bit flips in the neighboring rows of both X and Y. And they, uh, they ran this program in these uh, CPU architectures that you see here and observe real er er errors, raw hammer errors in real systems. Again, this is kind of demonstrated that raw hammer is a real reliability and security issue because you could induce bit splits by running a user level program in a real computing system. Uh, you can take over uh, an sec a secure system using these bit flips. And these two papers, uh, sorry, this, this paper on the bottom left, exploiting the near yeah, Rohan bug, the internal table list. I think this is a blog post, not a paper. This shows that you can, uh, this is from Google Project Zero, shows that you can take over systems by flipping bits. So this is a bit too detailed, but the basic idea is you put page tables in memory. So VRAM will contain some page tables of the programs that are that you run. And if you can, modify the right enable bit of any page table of your own program, then you can essentially edit, uh, so you can make, make this uh, page table pointer point to a page table first, and then uh, enable the right enable bit. Then you can edit your own page table, and that allows you to basically do everything in that system. But this is a very high level description of the attack, and it's much more difficult in real life to actually conduct this attack because you need to uh, put that certain bit in a location that you can generate a bit flip. That itself is very difficult. And it's made slightly more difficult in DDR4 with uh, some on die mitigation techniques or error mitigation techniques that we will discuss uh, 
in the upcoming slides. But that's the basic idea. You modify page table entries to gain access to the whole system. All right. So this, I think these are coverage from magazines, like the quotes, it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. Uh, and basically I'm flashing you some security implications from many different security venues. And this is one paper that was published, uh, I don't exactly, Dilma 2016. Basically the, the idea is you can induce these bit swaps from a JavaScript program running in a browser. And then uh, another paper showed that you can do determin uh, you can generate these bit flips deterministically in un Android phones, and you can gain root privileges. And other attacks, uh, so this is the same. Um, so sorry, this is this attack showed that you can um, generate these bit flips using uh, the GPUs, the graphic pro graphics processing units, and, and Android phone. And then uh, over over Ethernet, over LAN, uh, you can send some packages to a computer, and that triggers that can also uh, trigger or handle bit flips. So this is is a bit more important because you don't even have uh, you not even physical access. You um, you you only need remote access to this machine, and you only need to be able to send in some packets to be able to generate these bit flips. And then more papers about uh, Remote row hammer and row hammer in FPGA CPU platforms. Uh, there is also you can also um, steal or uh, use row hammer as a side channel to um, to steal information from another process. And again, I won't talk too much about the details of this attack, but the basic idea is row hammer bit Phillips are also data dependent, so. If you can um, put certain bits around a row that a victim process accesses, and if you observe uh, bit flips in those certain bits, then you can infer the data that the victim process has without having access to the victim process. That's the idea they exploit in this paper. Then uh, other papers show that you can uh, you can reduce Performance in like uh, of, of neural networks, performance in this case means accuracy or precision, perhaps, right? Uh, degrade the performance of neural networks by injecting targeted bit slips. Uh, again, Deep Hammer is another paper that does that. And finally, this paper um, shows that you can use raw hammer bit slips um, as a side channel if you can also analyze. Uh, this is side channel again, like you're stealing data from a uh, victim process by measuring power. So if you're interested, please look at these papers. Uh, I, I guess we can also see more security applications in the future based on what we have observed in the recent past. And uh, this paper uh, talks about Rohammer um, and its implications across the stack in more detail. And it could be a nice sheet if you're interested in uh, the Rohammer problem. Uh, Again, a more recent version of this paper is Fundamental Understanding and Solving Rohan. Uh, this was presented in uh, ASC DAC recently, I think last year in January. This is also a paper similar to the previous one, it talks about Rohan uh, and its implication on the whole stack and you know what's happening in uh, what's what are the recent developments in Rohan. All right, so I'll talk about what we uh, did in the past to understand Rohan. And I'll start with the analysis that the first paper we released on this topic is that uh, we used this, uh, the earlier version of the data vendor infrastructure to do these studies and tested this many modules, 129 in total. Uh, these modules were produced from to, uh, 2008 to 2014. Um, and the major characterization results are as I showed you here. But uh, Basically, I'll talk about some of the results in more detail. So here we're looking at, uh, on the x-axis, the distance between uh, a victim role's address and an aggressor role's address. But this is from the perspective of uh, this, uh, the memory control. 
So there can be some mapping between what the memory controller sees as a row address and what physically exists in the DRAM chip. So row address of zero could map to a physical row address of five, or the order that's the fifth row, basically. So this is not taking that into account. But yeah, if you're looking at memory controller, visible address is what you see is some behavior like this. It's showing that the immediately adjacent row to the aggressor row uh, has or it exhibits the most amount of bit flips for um, um, all manufacturers. And you can see that some of the non adjacent rows in the memory controller visible address space also exhibit row hammer bit flips. Um, you can recover these address mappings to figure out if actually the uh, physically the, uh, the aggressor row or the non aggressor, uh, sorry, the aggressor row or the non adjacent rows physically are actually adjacent. But in this study, the, they didn't do that. And we cannot go back to uh, 2014 to do the study again. So we don't exactly know if they're physically adjacent or if there's, a, um, there's an effect of row hammer that you know, reaches up over multiple rows. Uh, but the conclusion is most of the aggressors and victim roles are adjacent. Uh, they also looked at the access interval to the aggressor role and its effect on the number of errors. Uh, again, showing you only the three modules with the most errors from each manufacturer here. Uh, so we cannot go below 55 milliseconds because the infrastructure does not allow us to send uh, two activate commands within a 55 nanosecond time window. So we can start from 55 nanoseconds. And then we look at the bit error rate, um, how bit error changes with the access interval. And as you increase the access interval, the bit error rate reduces because the amount, uh, uh, because, hypothetically, because the amount of um, accesses you can make within a refresh window reduces also. So this makes sense. Uh, the next thing they look at is the refresh interval. So on the x-axis, you see the, uh, the default refresh interval highlighted 64 milliseconds for these DRAM chips that they tested. And basically, they sweep the refresh interval from 0 to 128 milliseconds. Well, I don't think they use 0, but 1 to 128 milliseconds. Again, using the three modules with the most errors, you see that as you increase the refresh interval, your bit error rate increases because you can perform more activations. Uh, you can hammer more times uh, before the next refresh comes and refreshes the, uh, restores the charge lost in that cell that you're attacking back. And conversely, like if you reduce the refresh interval, you have more bit flips. Uh, so if, if you reduce the refresh interval by seven times, uh, sorry, if you, if you do refresh operations seven times more frequently, you don't get any bit flips in the uh, tested the chips, but this comes with them overhead. Yeah. And they also investigate the effects of data patterns. So there on the left you use you see two data patterns, solid zeros and solid ones, and two different row stripe patterns on the right. So the row stripe data patterns resulted in 10 times more errors, for example. And this this way they conclude that program is also a data dependent error mechanism. There are other key observations in the paper, uh, but I won't talk about these. Uh, if you're interested, read this, please. Uh, other than that, more recently, we looked at Rohammer again, but this time using DDR4 chips and newer chips. So um, we looked at other uh, aspects of the Rohammer vulnerability as well, like how uh, does the position of a cell affect its Rohammer vulnerability? Uh, physical position, I mean, the temperature, uh, how, how, temp how temperature affects row handle bit flips, and um, how the amount of time you keep a row open while you hammer uh, an aggressive row uh, affects the row handle. Movement. So it has a different access patterns in this paper. I'll talk about uh, these in the upcoming slides, also I'll highlight some of the results. We looked at how row hammer vulnerability of a DRAM row changes with um, increased or reduced word line voltage supplied to the DRAM chip. Uh, and this, this is basically because we have sort of a powerful infrastructure to um, allow us to perform these studies. And then we, more recently, we also analyzed our hammer in uh, these high bandwidth memory chips that are, I think, intensively used in today's um, 
AI servers, I would say, or AI systems. Um, this paper that uh, was first published on this topic from our group, 2014, also provide, uh, proposed some raw handle solutions. Uh, they categorize these solutions to you know, immediate solutions and, or in, into two uh, classes, immediate solutions and longer term solutions. Immediate solutions could be implemented almost immediately. You could protect uh, DRAM, uh, so raw handle vulnerable DRAM chips in the field with these solutions, and longer term solutions are there to protect future DRAM chips, but with low, uh, basically these are better solutions uh, in terms of performance energy overhead than immediate solutions. Um, so they, I, I'd like to highlight PARA here. It's in the last line that you can see. PARA is proposed as best solution and, and it's somehow already implemented. It was employed in the field back then. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit. So PARA is basically, um, in the memory controller, with, for each activate command, you also throw a dice, or you, you, I, I don't know, generate a random number. And with some probability, you consider this activation to be an aggressive role, and the action you take to prevent bit flips is to refresh the victim nodes. Now you set the probability of this action based on the row handle vulnerability of your chip that you uh, deem, or you, basically you can understand this after you characterize your chips for their raw handle vulnerability. So if you can understand that uh, the, the hammer count or the activation count needed to induce the first bit flip in this chip is 10,000, you set your probability such that you will have only, uh, I don't know, one multiplied by 10 to the minus 15 errors uh, in five years uh, if you set the parameter to this, and you find that this, and then that's your parameter. Uh, so that's uh, something you can program also. And, and in that way, it's also good because you can increase or reduce the probability threshold, and then you have uh, protection at lower or higher raw hammer uh, thresholds. And um, some other approaches that this paper suggested was uh, more robust DRAM chips or error correcting codes. This was very costly. Uh, increased refresh rate. This was sort of employed, and I'll talk about it, but this is also very costly, and you cannot fix raw hammer errors by increasing refresh rate practically, essentially. Uh, physical isolation is also uh, a, not a good enough solution because um, how do you physically isolate things that requires a lot of effort and system design? And also, even if you physically isolate things, uh, there are some papers that show uh, that that doesn't really solve the whole problem and you can still induce bit slips to take over systems. Uh, there, are two, uh, there are these two other methods that are still relevant, I, I would say in the state of the art today. Uh, the first one is called reactive refresh or also referred to as preventive refresh. You determine a role to be an aggressive role and you preventively or reactively refresh its victim nodes. Now, how do you determine this? For para, it's you throw a dice, but other sophisticated mechanisms uh, all actually count the number of activations you do to every row or to some of the rows, or with some aliasing, uh, you know, they combine multiple rows, hammer counts, uh, or activation counts in one uh, hardware counter. And then uh, once that threshold reaches, you know, my the row hammer threshold of the chip, you activate, uh, you refresh its neighbor rows. And the other method is to proactively throttle accesses to an aggressive row before uh, it can induce row hammer bit flips. And I'll talk about uh, one uh, work that we did that is based on proactive throttling. And I'll talk about a few other works uh, that use the reactive refresh method in the upcoming slide. So all of these techniques have different cost, power, performance, and complexity trade-offs. And to this day, I argue that we are still not sure what the best one is. Probably a combination of all of them will end up being the best one in the future. Uh, this is from uh, 2014. It's Apple's security patch that says that they mitigate the ROM issue by increasing memory refresh rates. And we don't know how much they increased it, but they likely didn't increase it by seven times because the overheads would have been very large or noticeable. 
Probably they increased it by two times. I don't exactly know. And uh, this power solution that I described already, uh, I'll skip these slides. Um, it was also used, I think it was implemented by Intel in some processors. And you could even see some options about it in the, um, in the BIOS settings in some motherboards. So this is asking if you want uh, hardware raw hammer protection, that's Tara, or if you want to increase refresh by 2x as your raw hammer solution. It's kind of fun. Uh, because none of them are solutions of <laughs> we don't solve the problem. And then here's the more important fact that uh, this is the raw hammer activation probability, and you can set it to these predefined values, and that allows you to adjust the protection guarantees you have for your uh, system. But unfortunately, this was um, discontinued by, I don't know, these vendors, I, I guess. Uh, because DRAM manufacturers claim the DDR4 that they solved the raw hammer problem. But we will get to there also because that's also not true. So yeah, this paper proposed seven raw hammer solutions and it uh, showed that raw hammer was a widespread phenomenon in uh, back, back then, that day's DRAM chips. The takeaway from that study argument is main memory needs intelligent controllers for security, safety, reliability, and uh, I guess better scaling and dependability out of that. Uh, this is a side note. We also have similar infrastructures to investigate or analyze or understand the errors in NAND flash chips. So NAND flash chips are not maybe used as main memory today, um, but they're also interesting to look at in terms of errors. And they're subject to more errors as far as I know and my colleagues here can correct me if that's wrong than DRAM usually, but you also have uh, more time to deal with these errors. It allows you to develop more intelligent and sophisticated controllers for Flash uh, that have tons of tasks to prevent those uh, errors that happen. And these sort of infrastructures allowed us to understand the error behavior in Flash chips and develop better techniques to solve these errors. And I, I think I showed you this paper before, uh, this one, he spoke about raw hammer and, and the recent developments on flash and then again, uh, gave you meet them again. So uh, in, the, in the, I think in the recent years, there were two major raw hammer directions that were followed by you know, a ton of different recent uh, research ideas or works. Uh, one of them focused on understanding raw hammer. Um, and you can see that there are many effects, all, uh, many effects, that still need to be examined in these effects on raw hammer, like aging of DRAM chips, uh, environmental conditions, and so on. And then for solutions, uh, we would like flexible and efficient raw hammer solutions that are programmable because tomorrow my DRAM chips vulnerability might change, with, for example, aging. Uh, we don't know that, but it could happen. Uh, so they have to be patched, not have to be, but it's good if they're patchable and efficient. And then for architecting system and memory. Uh, to avoid uh, performance and denial of search problems. So we'll talk about basically all of these in the upcoming slides, uh, but I'd like to take a five minute break and then we do a one hour run for these more recent works and some results, okay? Do you have any questions so far? No. We don't have anything on Zoom. Do we have anything on YouTube? No. Uh, can be like used as a security Yeah. But like, um, have there been like, so what's the status of like, um, of any documented um, problems that arise when you, when you don't exploit it intentionally, but when it like happens in a running application? Um, yeah, so documented cases, as far as I know, there are none. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe a better answer is there are some papers that show, uh, th there are papers that do large scale data analysis on um, a ton of servers from, I don't know, for example, Meta does it in their own servers, uh, previously Facebook. And what they find is that there are so many, well, maybe so many is an exaggeration, but they identify the existence of uh, memory errors that are undetectable uh, by error correction codes. And you could say that those, like Rohammer bit flips likely contribute to those errors. So there are, so these errors, as far as we know, did not result in any, um, you know, sort of security exploit. There's no documentation of that happening, like a security attack, a large scale security attack, or a very costly uh, security attack. But uh, Rohammer errors probably manifest in today's systems. And they're either corrected by ECC, detected by ECC, and then your system has to go through some sort of maintenance. Um, like removing that DRAM chip, for example, and replacing it with what you think a good one, or they can go undetected and then might manifest as failures or might not manifest as failures. So documentation might exist in terms of research papers uh, that look at this data at large scale. Okay. So um, can I check if uh, across, uh, this is like crosstalk on the word line. Uh, can, you, can you ask me again? So, is this due to crosstalk on the word line where you read one word line that adjacent word lines are raised, or is it due to something else? This is due to crosstalk and many other things, probably. There are recent uh, device level papers that try to understand this issue in much more detail. Uh, I am not extremely confident enough to describe those right now, but I can point you to some papers basically that understand the issue. It has a lot to do with um, other things than cross talk as well. Is this also a problem with heteroelectric memory? Well, uh, something I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a good idea to check, I guess. <clears throat> I haven't seen papers that show Rohammer errors in ferroelectric DRAM. Maybe there are. No, no, it's fine. We'll finish most of the important things. Okay. So in the remainder of uh, this lecture, I'll talk about the most recent developments in Rohan, but we will start with the, the understanding that we developed first. So if my clicker works, we'll go to the next slide. This is the revisiting Rohammer paper, I'll show you some results from this analysis that we did recently. 
Uh, in 2020, we investigated wrote the Rohammer phenomenon in 15, 1,580 chips. Uh, these are DDR4 and LPDDR4 chips. And we saw that new DM chips are much more vulnerable to Rohammer. Um, and you can induce first bit slip in a DRAM chip if you activate a row only 4,800 times. That's enough for one chip. And that's a pretty low number. So that, that's like 20 microseconds of, or 200 microseconds of you know, real time to induce that bit slip. And then uh, chips of newer DRAM technology modes can exit row and flips um, in more rows and farther away from the victim row. This is what we also call the blast radius effect and what I showed in one of the previous plots where we had on the x-axis the distance from the aggressor uh, row. So there the distribution also became wider. Uh, and existing mediation mechanisms uh, in 2020 are not really effective solutions uh, for future technology models where we expect these, this 4800 number to be used. So these are the tested chips uh, you can find you can see here that we tested two technology nodes per DRAM type, three DRAM types, that's DDR3, 4, and LPDR4, and three major manufacturers. So this is one plot that shows the uh, effect of hammer count on the number of low hammer bit flips you get from um, different types of DRAM chips, all the new DRAM chips and across manufacturers. And the takeaway here is basically the bit for the plate increases when you go from an old node, old DDR4 technology node, to a new DDR4 technology node, for example, that's highlighted in the plot. And Rohan bit slips increase with technology, uh, bit for plates increase with technology node generation. Those are the basically the same things. Um, <coughs> this is showing you on the y axis the uh, active number of activations to induce the first Rohan bit slip for each chip, and you can see distributions across um, um, generations of the types of devices. So DDR3 old, uh, all the DDR3 old chips, uh, the, the value is plotted for each chip here. So this distribution shows you uh, the minimum and the maximum value that we observe. And the takeaway from this one is, uh, newer chips from each DDR manufacturer are more vulnerable to raw hand. Uh, in terms of this metric also. So previously we looked at the raw hammer bit error rates with increasing hammer count. And we also see the same exists for the hammer count needed to induce the first bit flow. And this is important. This is an important metric because this is um, what determines essentially your raw hammer vulnerability or the raw hammer vulnerability of a DRM chip. You want to prevent uh, more than this many activations to any DRM in that chip if you want to prevent uh, raw hammer bit flows. Well, uh, actually, only to that row is also fine, but then you need to know the raw hammer uh, vulnerability or the hammer count needed to induce the first bit row for each row. And we'll talk about that also because there is heterogeneity in that uh, value in, inside the DNA chip across rows. Because these are some more quantitative results that I will skip to, uh, because we won't have much time. And this is showing you the overhead. So that in terms of normalized system performance, so as you go down, this means the overhead of a evaluated mitigation mechanism that's shown in the legend with different lines also in the plot. Uh, as you go down uh, in, on the y-axis, the overheads get worse or become high. So the performance of overheads become higher. And on the x-axis, you see the projected number of hammers or activations required to induce the first row hammer with flip. These uh, vertical lines show you uh, what that number is for the according to the characterization results for different types of DRM chips, um, and you see the projection goes down to basically almost well hundred and then some value below hundred. I, I think sixty four is the lowest that we tested. Here you see that the ideal mechanism is significantly better than any existing mechanism back there. So ideal is basically uh, you have the activation count for each row, uh, like perfect tracking of the activation count of each row, and then you only do refresh operations when necessary. All the other mechanisms have some sort of uh, trouble coming from aliasing issues, but they cannot uh, 
perfectly keep track of the activation counts of each row because keeping that activation count for every row uh, is very uh, costly because that requires you to add more hardware. Um, and the other mechanisms that you see here uh, don't implement as many counters, for example, as, as there are rows in your DM chip, and thereby they cannot keep track of the actual activation count. And that induces more preventive refresh operations, and that thereby induces more overhead. And one thing that's rather unique here is para. Para, the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, taken, well, that's left after that. So basically, uh, for this point, for example, this one, uh, you can see the master. Yeah. Uh, this means that when you add the mitigation, your system's performance is 20% of what it was before. So like a reduction of five times in your system performance. And then for Para, you don't, well, Para doesn't obviously have you know, uh, the uh, hardware area overheads because you only need to be able to generate some random numbers and that's rather cheap compared to having a counter for each row. Uh, but the overhead of Para also increased significantly as you reduce the row hammer threshold. And you can see that at 64, like at the row hammer threshold or HC first of 64, uh, your performance becomes worse than 10%. The normalized system performance less than 10%. Uh, so the conclusion is uh, in 2020, at least, there's significant opportunity for developing a row hammer solution with low performance of head. And I would argue this is still the case uh, for low performance overhead. Though, of course, there have been uh, many defenses or solutions that have been proposed since then, um, but we're still interested in developing more efficient solutions. There's still uh, room for improvement. Uh, this paper, deeper look, uh, and try to understand new characteristics of row hammer. The, the three main things we looked at was temperature, aggressor row active time, that's how long you keep an uh, aggressor row activated or open before you close it, and the victim theorem cells physical location. I will highlight only maybe a few results like this one. So this is special, this is the uh, Roman vulnerability, spatial variation across shows in, this, uh, in terms of the minimum activation count or HC first. On the y axis, we show the HC first value. Uh, for um, the, the, the x axis, is showing you the DRAM rows. It's like a population of DRAM rows. So if, uh, maybe I will draw some lines here. So um, if you look at P, P1, for example, and look at only this purple line, that's for one module. Uh, this means 1% of your rows had more than, I guess, 250K HC first, um, but 99% of your rows had an HC first value, uh, well, higher than like 50K. Or maybe the other, if you look at this the other way, almost 1% uh, of your rows only suffer from a relatively low HC first. And the other rows are relatively fine. So they can um, they can withstand more activation before the bit flips are induced. So there's heterogeneity in the distribution of your minimum activation count. Um, this is what it says. And here it's the same plots for different manufacturers, modules from different manufacturers. And I'll talk about one thing, uh, one implication of that, and I'll move to the next paper. So this example difference in provenance here, this paper discusses the difference in provenance in much more detail, but from that observation, uh, we can actually configure our differences in a way that they, um, they're draw aware per se. So that means uh, for each show, they apply a different, or the, they, they consider a different HC first value, row hammer threshold value. And this uh, breakdown of DRAM rows uh, figure on the left is depicting the, uh, the, the fraction of rows uh, that have a value of HC first and the fraction of the rows that have a value of two times that HC first. So only 10% of your rows suffer from a low HC first value, whereas 
the other 90% can actually withstand more activations, two times more activations. And the paper also has analysis on uh, the effects of considering this observation for two um, Rohan mitigation methods, block hammer and graphene. Um, I will talk about block hammer uh, more in detail later, but graphene is a uh, back then state of the art uh, counter based track uh, uh, Rohan prevent uh, mitigation mechanism. So when you actually apply these observations for those mechanisms, you can reduce their uh, hardware area costs by 33 and uh, 80% respectively. So that is a sort of a good implication of, a good, good example of um, showing that understanding Rohan better can um, enable better uh, solutions or improve, so improve our solutions. So I'll leave the discussion on deeper look at this, but uh, this uh, talk from Girard, the first author of this paper, um, talks about these in more detail, so if you can follow this talk. Uh, we've done more analysis on Rohammer. Uh, this one is Rohammer versus road line voltage. Uh, I'll just flash this and move on to the next one. Uh, we looked at the Rohammer vulnerability in HBM2 chips, as I mentioned earlier. Again, I will flash this and move on to the next one. So we move on to Rohammer solutions, actually. Uh, but before we discuss new raw hammer solutions, we will motivate uh, them because if you remember, uh, the manufacturer said VDR4 no longer suffers from raw hammer at some point. So TRRS pass showed otherwise in 2020. So this is exploiting the many sides of target row refresh. And it's first work to show that TRR protected, TRR is target row refresh, it's the defense mechanisms. Uh, defense mechanisms mechanism against raw hammer uh, in DDR4. Uh, TR protected DRAM chips are vulnerable to raw hammer in the field. In the field, mean you know the, the chip that you use probably in your laptop or computer at some point. Uh, and the mitigations that the manufacturers advertised as secure are actually not secure. Uh, the issue with those mitigations were and still are, they don't know how they were. The manufacturers don't disclose what they implement. And this paper was able to actually find out the weaknesses of those um, mitigations and devise a many-sided raw hammer attack that can induce bit flips uh, by bypassing these TRR mitigations in real DRAM chips, real DDR4 chips. Um, I'll talk about this idea in more detail in the upcoming slides. And um, it partially also reverse engineered the target row refresh and pseudo target row refresh mitigation mechanisms. These are implemented in DRAM chips and the memory controllers in uh, the system they tested. And also provide an automatic tool that can create this many sided raw hammer attack for uh, DDR4 and LT DDR4 chips for the system you all run this binary and it finds the correct many sided raw hammer attack for you. Uh, this is an example to the many sided hammering pattern. Uh, on the right, for example, you see uh, the four sided access pattern. The red rows are, I guess, the rows and blue rows, vapor um, rows. And these are uh, different many sided attack patterns that induce bit flips in different modules because different modules implement different TRR mechanisms. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is an analysis from the paper how many uh, bit flips each um, pattern induces with how many, when you have how many aggressive rows on the x axis. Um, and they have basically shown that these modules that they tested, uh, most of those, well, uh, at least some of those modules that you can see here, uh, where the best patterns indicated, or when, when there are found patterns, that's not a, a, you know, a straight line. Uh, that means they have bypassed the TRR mitigation mechanisms in those modules. So it didn't by bypass uh, all modules defense mechanisms. But you can see that bypassing only one is enough because VDR4 manufacturers said that they were raw hammer free then. So they were not raw hammer free. And uh, these are results from LPDR4 chips or systems that have LPDR4 chips. So you see. 
and yeah, here's another table that shows. Um, so this 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 table shows how much time you need to um, to perform some certain type of exploit that you see in the first line of the, the first row of the table. Um, this is just more information for you. And the key results, I guess I won't repeat this in the interest of time, uh, but the paper kind of showed that Rohammer was still a problem back right then. And security by obscurity, this is referring to how the manufacturers keep their implementation secret and just claim that it solves the issue is likely not a good solution because it didn't solve anything. Uh, the paper we just described kind of partially uncovered these mechanisms and figured out some access patterns to bypass them. But um, using our um, DRAM-based testing infrastructure, we were actually able to understand these mitigation mechanisms in much more detail. And uh, we did this analysis in the Uncovering India Mohan Protection Paper for UTRR. Um, we show that TRR is not fully secure, and we basically validated it's well, it, we verified that it's not secure. How can we validate? So this, a new, this paper develops a new methodology that leverages data retention failures to uncover the inner workings of TRR. Um, the key idea is, uh, I will have a different slide to describe the key idea. Uh, well, maybe I don't, so I'll describe it over this. So the key idea is you will have some, let me just do it. You have retention failures in the jump. So even if you don't do any row hammer, some cells will uh, fail. Now, uh, how do you prevent retention failures? You refresh cells. And what does row hammer mitigation mechanisms do? They also refresh cells in one row, right? So what this paper does, that the key idea of, of this reverse engineering methodology is um, you figure out that a row was refreshed by a TRR mechanism uh, by observing that retention errors have not occurred when they should have occurred in that DRAM. So you're activating some uh, rows that you have chosen and if they're sampled as aggressor rows by the mitigation technique, they will, uh, the, the mitigation technique or the TRR technique inside the DRAM chip will refresh some victim rows. If you know the retention profile for those victim rows, you can deduce if the TRR mechanism sampled your aggressor row as a real aggressor row. And that, that key idea allows you to actually uncover a lot of details about the inner workings of these mechanisms. That's the key idea. And then uh, we tested 15 DDR modules from each major, each of the three major manufacturers. And we show that all 45 modules are vulnerable to Rohammer. This is different from what the previous paper showed. There were some modules that they couldn't induce bit service. 99.9% uh, .9 of rows in the bank experienced at least one Rohammer bit flip. And up to seven Rohammer bit flips in an eight byte data where you can induce. Uh, so this is an important implication for ECC, uh, error correcting codes, because even if you throw the very strong ECC at this, it won't be able to just uh, correct all the seven bit first. And if you do, you will suffer from a lot of redundancy overhead. Uh, typically that comes as, you know, you know the, the form of more chips that you need to add to a module, which no one wants to do. Then the big key takeaway from the study is TRR does not provide security against row hammer. And UTRR, this tool that we developed, can facilitate uh, the development of new row hammer attacks and more secure row hammer protection techniques. Uh, I won't go into the, these details again. Um, so I'll move on to the next uh, thing that motivates these new defense mechanisms. This is a blog post from Google, uh, Google Security Fall. Uh, they introduced this half double pattern. It's a new handling technique for DRAM row hammer bug. Uh, the idea is um, you see on the left picture, it's a classic row hammer attack, and on the right, you have a half double attack. Uh, you have two aggressors here, or well, in this picture, there are three aggressors. 
uh, but we will look at A, B, and C. Uh, here we're hammering A very frequently, and B not so much frequently. And this results in bit flips in victim row C. So aggressor B is referred to as a row that carries over the effect of hammering aggressor A and inflicting bit flips in victim C. Now this uh, plays quite well with TRR because if you actually frequently access aggressor A, the TRR mechanism will sample that as an aggressor row activation and it will refresh aggressor row B, uh, but a refresh is essentially an activation. So that allows you to carry over the um, effect of hammering row A over to row C. And the, uh, in, in the paper, uh, there's a paper that was published in Nixonic Security 2022. Uh, they have this analysis where they show uh, you can do half double combine it with TRR to uh, generate bit flips in certain uh, modules. So it's quite interesting if you uh, are interested in Rohan in general, this is another good read. I'll go on to talk about the solution, actually. The section header was about solutions. This is our first solution. It's a block hammer. It's called block hammer, uh, preventing Rohan at low cost, by blacklisting rapidly accessed DM rows. This is one of the techniques that use uh, the um, preventive uh, sorry, proactive uh, throttling mechanism. So we won't allow the rows to reach a certain activation count, and that's how we're going to prevent row hammer bit flips. Uh, uh, there are two main targets uh, of this defense mechanism. First, uh, we want it to scale with worsening row hammer vulnerability. Uh, back then, uh, the, the worst row hammer vulnerability was, I guess, 4,800. It still is the same, like the lowest observed row hammer threshold. Uh, is 4,800 so, and that's from revisiting raw hammer paper. And the second goal is to be compatible uh, with commodity DRAM chips. So we don't want to change anything in the DRAM interface or anything in the DRAM chips themselves. Uh, the block camera mechanism basically, as I described, slows accesses to a row A if we detect that row A as a um, aggressor role. So how do you detect them? I will talk about it in the next slide. Uh, but preventively, sorry, uh, proactively throttling accesses or slowing down accesses to go away will prevent bit flips. And uh, the paper shows you uh, a, a security proof, basically this, um, this proof, proof proven to be secure uh, that bit flips won't occur. And one other good thing about block hammer is when you detect or when you identify an, an aggressor goal, um, you can actually optionally inform the system software about this attack. You can um, tell the system software that, oh, this thread that made this memory request, uh, it's likely an attacker thread, or it's, this thread is likely doing a row hammer attack. You can do something about it. And the paper has an analysis on uh, how that information can allow you to um, maintain high performance for applications that are benign, that are not doing row hammer attacks in a system and reduce the performance of only the row hammer attacker programs. But uh, that's a bit of detail and I please read the paper if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so how do we find aggressor rows? There are two components to block hammer. One of them is called row blocker and the other one is called the attack throttler. Uh, the row blocker will track row activation rates using area efficient bloom filters. Bloom filters are like structures that uh, you access with a hash. So um, it's a, it allows you to um, implement, in, in our case, it will allow us to implement fewer counters to track the same amount of row addresses. Uh, but it will also allow us to minimize um, overlap of different addresses to the same set of counters. So it will minimize this aliasing issue that we will uh, talk about in another paper later on. So then once you find rows that are activated at a very high rate, you will blacklist them. Blacklisting means you will not allow them to be activated for a certain period of time. That will have some overheads and paper over, obviously evaluates that. So 
It's not too much, don't worry. And then you will throttle activations that target this flat as you go. And that's uh, done in the way I just mentioned. So, no, so that no role can be activated the high enough rate to induce this uh, The attack throttler identifies threads that perform a row hammer attack. This is the system cooperation I mentioned earlier. And reduces memory bandwidth usage for the identified attacker threads. And then you greatly reduce the performance degradation uh, and then an energy base of a row hammer attack uh, by doing so. And this is uh, the results from the paper. Uh, I won't talk too much about this, uh, but we tested raw hammer thresholds down to 1,000, and we showed that low hammer has very low performance energy, uh, sorry, performance and energy overheads. And when there's a raw hammer attack, um, the raw hammer, so, so when there's a raw hammer attack, block hammer um, provides much higher performance than state-of-the-art mechanisms because it allows you to throttle the attacker threat and kind of prevent the raw hammer attack essentially. Okay, yes. I mean, so why exactly is the throttling and the direction like implemented? Uh, sorry, where? So where is the, the solution like implemented? Which part of the system? Uh, it's in the memory control, but it also has to communicate somehow with the processor because we need the thread identifier. Okay, so it gets done again. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I will talk about more Roham solutions now, more interesting Roham solutions. Okay. Uh, hopefully, this is somehow clear that main memory needs intelligent controllers to prevent Roham, and it will come with other benefits if we actually you know, open up some innovation in this area in real life. Uh, it will help with other stuff as well, other reliability issues as well. And one tool that we developed that allows us to evaluate these intelligent memory controller techniques is Emulator 2.0. I think it was uh, recently finally published on New York Picture Letters. So this is a, a this is a simulator that we use. Uh, an earlier version of this we have used in many studies, and we continue to use it and maintain it. Um, and we we also developed we also implemented already um, I think five or more. Um, state-of-the-art ROM solutions that fall into these categories uh, in, in the um, 2.0 version of demo. So I'll talk about a very recent uh, ROM mitigation mechanism, Comet. It's a comp min sketch based row tracking uh, to mitigate ROM at low cost. This was very recently um, published in HPC, a high performance computer architecture uh, symposium. Uh, actually, we presented this two weeks ago uh, in Edinburgh. So I'll do my best to explain, you know, the, the key ideas here. Uh, so this paper sort of has to start with an overview of uh, previous mechanisms, previous uh, mitigation techniques. We refer to them as preventive refresh-based mitigation mechanisms. These are reactive refresh that, that I described earlier. You can choose to implement one activation counter per DRAM node, so every DRAM node. Uh, on the DRAM chip, you have a counter for that in your processor chip. But because, uh, so the good thing about this is the performance and energy costs of such a technique will be very low because you can keep the exact uh, activation count or the real activation count of a DRAM row in your uh, per row counters. But it's part of the area cost is huge because you have 128,000 DRAM rows in a bank, and you have 16 banks, and you have um, multiple modules in your system, and then in each channel, and you have multiple channels, and the overhead is huge. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quantified here. Maybe it is. No, it's not. But it's huge, just believe me uh, for now. Um, you can choose to implement uh, one accurate counter per aggressor row. Now we're kind of restricting the definition um, of aggressive row here implicitly, um, but you will be implementing a fixed amount of counters, and each of those counters will have a tag 
that you will use to identify or keep track of the activation counts of certain aggressor rows that are the most frequently activated rows uh, in a certain time window. And there are certain algorithms that allow us to actually implement these mechanisms and uh, sort of proven to be able to track the most frequently activated rows only. Uh, one of them is called misregrees. I think it's confidence is also similar. Um, but these, this will come with low performance overheads because you can still keep track of um, the at least the most frequently activated rows at a very high uh, with a very high accuracy. Uh, accuracy meaning the the activation count of the row that you think is very similar to the activation count of the row in sort of real uh, life. Um, it's obviously the activation count you you have is higher than the real activation. It cannot be lower because then you would have program bit flips. You have to keep an activation count that's higher than um, the activation count in real life. And the there's there might be some overhead, additional overhead on top of um, what one activation count per VRAM row based mechanisms will get you because you will have some false positives, some extra activations due to everything in this structure that you have. And the area costs for this, although it might be lower than uh, implementing one activation count per VRAM row, it's still very high because you still need to implement many counters and the counters you need to implement increase with the number of aggressive roles. And the number of aggressive roles increase with reducing your hammer threshold. Because um, let's say that you have a row hammer threshold of 1,000. Um, that means in a refresh window of 64 milliseconds, you can activate 64 million divided by 1,000 different rows to a point where they are uh, inducing bit flips. That's the number of aggressive rows you have. And when you reduce the row hammer threshold to 500, for example, you have twice as many potential aggressive rows. You need to be able to track all of them. So your area costs will increase. And there's a point actually where the area cost of this uh, exceeds the area cost of the other one. Yeah. So how do you determine which row is the aggressive row? Is it just by the number of activations? Number of activations, yes. And uh, to actually have this sort of structure where you can find um, the activation count of a row based on its address, you need to implement some tags and that requires a content addressable memory. And that kind of adds like a constant cost to the area uh, overhead of these uh, techniques. And then there are um, techniques that implement fewer than one counter per DRAM row. That can be, for example, para. It implements no counters per VRAM. It's just a random number generator. And uh, there are techniques that explicitly like share um, counters across VRAM rows. That's like 512 VRAM rows will share one counter. And these mechanisms um, have other aspects that allow them to actually uh, pro probably secure should be probably secure against row hammer bit flips, but I won't talk too much in detail about them. But these are these are low area costs and they have high performance and energy costs. Uh, so I'll leave this at that. Uh, and the key observation in this paper is hash based counters are low cost. What are those? We will come to it later. And tag based counters are highly reactive. Tag based counters are the second column in the previous slide. Uh, what's a hash based counter that basically um, takes your row address through a hash function? In this example, you um, get, so you divide the row ID by four and then get the remainder to, uh, identify, to, to address your counters based on a row address. And uh, they can be implemented with low cost structures. That means that doesn't require content addressable memory. And they can aggregate many rows activation counts together. Um, so this comes at a low cost, but you have a problem here. So you have this aliasing problem where uh, two different rows will map to the same counter. And if you activate row zero, the counter for 
the, the counter zero, zero here will increase. If you activate row four, uh, the counter zero here will also increase again. So the overhead is potential performance. Uh, and then time based funding obviously, obviously are uh, accurate. Uh, they, they can accurately track uh, each aggressive row's activation time. So you mix them together um, because the first the hash space functions have, uh, have a drawback, and tag based functions can allow it, yeah. allow you to uh, overcome that drawback. Uh, so the key idea is to essentially mix them together. But I'll uh, reiterate this. So the first part of the key idea is to use these hash space counters to track most of the DRAM rows activation counts uh, with low area overhead. And the second component is to use the highly accurate tag based counters to track only the small set of DRAM rows that are uh, subject to a lot of aliasing essentially in the hash based counters to achieve low performance overhead. Now I won't go to the details of the mechanism and the drawbacks of you know, each counter array, uh, but uh, I'll talk about the, the analysis, area overhead analysis. We, we, we will see the area overheads of three mechanisms. One is to comment this work. Uh, the other one is graphene and a hydra is a hydra is a very low cost mechanism that uh, belongs to the third category. It's sharing some counters across the animals. Uh, so comment is like this. It's row hammer, addition row hammer threshold, comments area overhead also reduces because the number of bits you need to count up to 1,000 is more than the number of bits you need to count up to 125. It's the row hammer threshold. Um, so this says, and graphene's uh, overhead increases because it needs to implement many more counters. And um, now if you compare comment to hydra, Especially at low row hammer threshold, you see that it has significantly less area overhead. And for Hydra, it's, Hydra's uh, area overhead behaves similar to um, Comet. Its overhead reduces as the number of as the, the row hammer threshold reduces. So the takeaway here is Comet increases significantly less area overhead than graphene and similar area overhead to Hydra. But how does it perform? So we will look at DM uh, uh, sorry performance and DM energy here. This is going to be average across, uh, I think, 61 single core applications. Um, and on the x-axis, you see different row hammer threshold values. On the y-axis, you see normalized IPC. So again, a higher value will uh, have a bet better perform will mean better performance, and a lower value will mean lower performance. And one on the y-axis corresponds to a baseline system that doesn't implement any um, defense mechanism. So this is showing you the overhead uh, of Comet, even at a row hammer threshold of 125. The average performance overhead across all these 61 uh, single core applications is 4%. Uh, the DRAM energy overhead is uh, similar, like the trend in the DRAM energy overhead is similar because uh, as the row hammer threshold reduces, you perform more uh, prevent the refresh operations and that has both an energy overhead and performance overhead. That's it. So that's what I wanted to talk about. But comment, do you have any questions with, for this one? So one more. Cool. Then I will want to advocate which is accepted to use Senex Security 2024. Uh, which means we will present it this August, actually. Uh, but I'll give only the key observations and ideas in this paper. So this is all bank activation counters for scalable and low overhead low hammer mitigation. Uh, I will skip this. Um, but just to reiterate on the, like how we organize DRAM uh, today, you see on the top a DRAM module, consists of multiple DRAM chips. In the chip, you have multiple DRAM banks that share the same interface. And the key idea uh, is basically if you can distribute your accesses to different banks, you leverage bank double parallelism. So you uh, overlap the latency of activating a row in one bank with activating a row in another bank. That's how you can uh, leverage bank double parallelism to increase performance. And then there are some ways and uh, Inside the subway, we have cells, and this part doesn't really 
um, is important is not so important for what I'm going to describe. Here. The key observation we make in this paper is um, I'm showing you. Well, I have an animation bug, but this plot shows you on the x-axis 34 uh, different memory intensive single core workloads, so 34 different boxes here. And the y-axis is slightly complicated, but it's the number of activations to the DRAM nodes with the same low ID before the same node is activated again. So I talked about how we overlap uh, the latency of activating rows in one bank with the latency of activating rows in the other bank. So we have row X in bank zero, if you access that. This plot is showing you, it's very likely that you will access row X in other banks, in many other banks actually, before you access row X in bank zero again. So the Y axis goes up to 31 because there are 32 banks in total. So the largest number you could observe here is 31. And the key takeaway we make is, after accessing a row with address R is what I just said, address R in one bank, the rows at address R in other banks are also likely to get free. So we'll just leverage this idea, uh, this observation to develop a key idea, which is you'll store the activation count of the rows with the same row ID in one count. And by doing so, we have reduced the number of counters that we need to implement by a factor of 32 or by a factor of the number of banks you have in each system. Uh, this is what you will have in a you know classic row hammer uh, well, counter-based de defense mechanism. You have um, one counter for every bank that stores a row ID and the activation count for that row in that bank. You're interested in finding only actually the maximum activation count of uh, row X across all banks. And we develop a mechanism that allows us to keep track of this value just using one count. And the details of that, uh, I won't talk about. But the results are, I would say, quite good. But quantitatively, it's faster than the lowest area cost counter based defense mechanism. This was Hydra when we developed this idea. And it's smaller in, in hardware area than the lowest performance overhead counter based defense mechanism, which is graphene. And it only incurs 0.59% average performance overhead for all the, uh, the same 61 single core workloads as comment. And the future row hammer threshold of 1000, we say future because the lowest we have observed so far is 4800. Um, and it only needs 9.79 kilobytes on chip storage per DMA. And the ultra low threshold of 125, the overhead of our case is only 1.52%. Uh, but it's uh, AO has increased slightly, but it's still small, much smaller than graphene's, while it has competitive performance to graphene. So that's our case. Uh, now, if you, if you have any questions about that, or if, if not, I'll talk about another mechanism that was recently actually presented in HPCA two weeks ago. Again, this is called special variation of where we disturb the defenses. Experimental analysis of real DM chips and implications on future solutions. Actually, this is a two part study. This is both uh, um, improving our understanding of draw and mobility and devising better solutions with that understanding. Uh, the basic idea is that you have special variation in read disturbance vulnerability uh, across DRAM nodes. Read disturbance is referring to draw hammer here. Uh, to induce a row bit flip, you should access one row. Um, for some rows, it will be one to 10,000 times. For some rows, the majority of rows actually it will be in the range 10,000 to 100,000. And for some very resilient rows, it will be about 100,000 times. Uh, so there's special variation in the vulnerability. But uh, today we configured the disturbance solutions for the worst uh, row. That means if you have a row number threshold of 5,000 in a DRM chip, but the average row hammer threshold is 50,000. You're on average overestimating your vulnerability by 10 times. So this paper says, okay, don't do it. Right? Because not all rows need the same level of protection. Um, so we can get rid of the overheads of considering every row the worst case. And then the paper analyzes this 144 DM chips from three major manufacturers. And you see the uh, 
dye division that indicates the manufacturing date and that could indicate the manufacturing date or technology and the chip organization. Uh, so this figure is a bit hard to parse, but let me uh, explain it. So this is showing you the spatial variation in the minimum hammer count, that's HD first, to induce the first bit foot across the hammer rows. It's the row hammer vulnerability metric we're using. And each bar shows you a different module uh, from the same vendor. And the, on the x-axis, you see the minimum hammer count. That's the HC first value. And the y-axis is the fraction of the DRAM. So this is a histogram, essentially. And if you follow only this uh, color that corresponds to um, S2, for example, that, that has this box in um, 12K, and this box in 16K, this is just showing you that 40% of the rows have a row hammer threshold of 12K. And uh, more, slightly more than 60% of rows have a row hammer threshold, 16K. So if you look at this distribution, um, and the, the, the error bars there, I didn't tell you, but it's showing you the variation across banks. Um, you can see that the variation um, across rows in HC first for the module S4 is this wide. Uh, so it, module S4 has rows that have HC first values of 12K and 128K. And not all bars are visible here. So it's a bit hard to make. But that tells you that uh, the minimum error count in this first bit for significant varies across rows. And then uh, in SWER, we integrate uh, this observation with an existing row hammer defense mechanism. We, I will describe this over para first. Uh, so you already remember para, you just throw the dice, then you add the number, and then if, uh, that's bigger than a certain threshold that you determined with before. Uh, this go activation you count as an aggressive go activation, prevent a refresh to the most. Now in SWEAR, what you just do is you have this threshold, uh, a higher threshold for more vulnerable roles, and a lower threshold for um, less vulnerable roles. Sorry, the other way around. So less vulnerable roles, you can apply a higher threshold, so you can um, prevent a refresh that throws victims less frequently, and vice versa. And then you dynamically tune higher threshold to the victim roles vulnerability. The only thing you need to know is uh, the, the, the vulnerability level of the victim role. So you need to actually now have some sort of state uh, to maintain, you need to maintain some state that indicates the vulnerability level of the role you're accessing. So it's not as wide as a counter. You can encode that information using uh, only a few bits. And the paper describes two ways of, two different ways of doing that, like having dedicated storage for this information in the memory control, or uh, you can actually store that information in your um, in your ECC chips that's used to store normally parity bits for your error correcting codes. That's the redundant bits that you need to be able to correct some uh, errors in, in your in your word that you're accessing the uh, So along with that parity bit, those parity bits you store this information. You can do this because you don't need all um, capacity uh, added by the ECC chips uh, to store the parameters completely. Uh, Swag so can work with many disturbance solutions, including block hammer, Hydra, RRS, Aqua, uh, and the paper discusses how, uh, well, the paper evaluates the performance for each of those, actually, but I'll showcase para for now. Uh, so you'll see, again, uh, X axis is the minimum hammer count, that's X the first ranging from 4,000 to 64. 64 is a very important number um, for the X the first. Um, and the Y axis is showing weighted speed up. The weighted speed up is a performance metric for we use for multi core workloads. And here, uh, a higher value will be better again. And this is normalized to no mitigation baseline, meaning one will represent the performance for the baseline system without any mitigation mechanisms. So I'll draw the overhead of para with no swear. So this is uh, similar to the plot you've seen before in revisiting your hammer. Para's overhead increased significantly as 
raw hammer threshold reduces. Um, and we will plot three lines for sweat uh, that are tuned for the error profile or characterization profiles from each, uh, from one module from each manufacturer, H and S manufacturers. So this is for H1, which has uh, arguably, well, uh, let me draw all of them actually. So first, Swear so improves paras performance overhead or reduces paras performance overhead by allowing it to uh, apply a dynamic it's the first uh, dynamic over threshold for every role. Uh, that means you will do preventive refresh operations less frequently <coughs> or as frequently as if you think about it. Now this reduction in performance overhead can go up to 1.95. Well, this performance can be improved. Uh, at row and threshold of 64 by two times almost. Uh, and this depends on the uh, vulnerability profile of the DRAM module. So if the DRAM module consists of one uh, DRAM role that has a very low HC first value, but the majority of the roles have higher HC first values, the performance benefits you see will increase. Because without sword, you have to configure your defense mechanism according to the problem vulnerability of the worst role. And the paper analyzes uh, sword over different problem mitigation techniques. And the conclusion is that it significantly reduces the performance overhead of existing solutions. And you can find more details uh, at that link over there that will lead you to the paper. Uh, there's a Go ahead. You can come up with the vulnerabilities level, like the number of, of activations per person. Uh, we use this uh, infrastructure that we developed, uh, the, the, uh, the DM vendor infrastructure that allows us to test DM chip. But uh, if you're asking about the experiment methodology, what you do is uh, you basically start from a hypothetical value for, for each of us. I'm going into details now, uh, but if you cannot follow me, just let me know. Uh, so let's assume that your assumption is, oh, this row will fail. Um, this row will induce failures after 50,000 activations. And you do 50,000 activations. Did it induce a failure? If yes, you need to test with a smaller threshold. Well, so you need to uh, record that information and then test we, what we usually use like a binary search. So 50,000 did induce a bit flip. So let's test with 25,000. And if there's still a bit flip, you reduce it by half again. If there's no bit flip at 12,000, then you go up. You're trying to find uh, where exactly that bit flip will happen. So you do this multiple times to find the minimum value to, to remove variations. Uh, is that? And so, so you measure this for every row yeah. before like, using the system? And That's true. For the entire operation uh, That's a very good point. Actually, this in this paper, we also have some data uh, on a preliminary aging study. How does uh, the XC first of a row um, change over time? What we did is we ran a row hammer attack for 61 days. We profiled the row hammer threshold for every row before that 61 days and after 61 days. And we see a reduction for a very small fraction of the rows. And that means you cannot actually have this, like I will profile this one time and I'm done. You have to periodically profile your uh, rows for the HC first file reduction. So just to confirm here, hammering a row is the number of times checking the adjacent row, whether this is a bit different. Yes. So does this also apply to victim roles that are not adjacent to the, because of, I think earlier you said about the DJ, yeah. where yeah. victim roles might not be adjacent to the graphic aggressive role. So does this also account for that? Exactly. So we actually don't read only the immediate neighbors, but we read like a logical distance of eight uh, or uh, based on. Uh, so we also have an idea on what the address mapping looks like. Uh, that's why we can for sure know um, which logical rows correspond to which physical rows. We know that mapping actually. And then we can check for actually eight like rows that are physically eight distance away, uh, eight rows away from the aggregate. So we check all of them. Yeah. 
questions. Uh, maybe I made an overclaim about making it to the end of the slide deck, but let's, I mean, I'll just continue. You can leave whenever you want, is that fine? But I will be happy if you leave after 6 p.m. Uh, <laughs> so this is another class, like another class of defenses. The key idea here is uh, to dynamically remap an aggressive row uh, to, um, to, to a different physical row before a row hundred physical pairs. Um, this does not require you to refresh victim rows, but instead you're sort of distributing the hammering effect to many physical locations by moving the aggressor around continuously as it gets hammered. Uh, so you relocate, you have to relocate this data. So rows are very huge. Uh, so I won't talk too much about this, but I, I will talk about its overheads a bit, uh, just for you to have an idea. It kind of goes against, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, reducing data. Movement. So this is something that would increase data, movement, of course because one row is typically large, it's eight kilobytes in DDR4. Uh, so you need to move eight kilobytes of data when one row is activated lower than a row hammer threshold times. So you cannot allow this row to be activated row hammer threshold times before you move. Uh, so if there's a row hammer attack going on, what you do is you keep moving an aggressive row around in your uh, VRAM band. Now there are methods to accelerate this, like there's a paper called shadow that Proposal doing this data movement within a survey uh, in a much faster way by uh, uh, leveraging you know, the, um, the analog oper operation at the survey level in the uh, to activate a row that brings the row to the sense amplifiers. Now, from there, you can actually write it back. You don't have to transport data to the memory controller and then back to the um, DRAM chip in smaller chunks. You can just copy that row to the sensor amplifiers and then to another row if you implement that capability in your DRAM chips. It's also called, uh, it's also similar to the row clone idea. If you have heard of it, you might be able to relate. But other than that, I'll leave the discussion on this at this level. Now, these are the papers that have this key idea of moving data around. It started with, I guess, Crow, a low cost substitute for improving DRAM performance and the reliability. And then randomized row swap, aqua, uh, scalable and secure row swap that's found that randomized row swap is not secure. Actually, it's uh, then showed a secure way of doing it. And then most recent one is uh, Shadow, as far as I know, it was published in HCA this last year around this time. So migration based techniques also exist. And uh, we see that industry is also developing some fancy row hammer prevention techniques. This one is from SD Hynix. Uh, here you have, um, well, the, there are two methods here. One probabilistic mechanism that's not so interesting. Uh, the other one is a determ more deterministic mechanism uh, that is uh, basically adding counters. So you, you, will, you will have counters that track the activation count of DRAM rows, and these counters of DRAM solve themselves. Uh, so this manufacturer, uh, this paper shows that, uh, shows a prototype chip that has additional DRAM cells that are used simply for uh, tracking the activation count of a DRAM row and additional, you know, circuitry that does the, um, when, when you access a DRAM row, you need to increment the counter, so there's an incrementer inside the DRAM chip for that specific purpose. Um, so industry is taking some, I think, interesting steps. And this is an excerpt from that paper. And you can see the layout uh, of the DRAM chip. And the, the cells that I mentioned as counter cells are highlighted as this very thin uh, rectangle here, RH counting cell, that's row hammer counting cell. And then some additional control circuitry for that increment uh, logic. So these chips, well, they're prototype. We don't know if they're in production, but it's an interesting step. And then there's this paper from uh, Samsung, it's low cost row hammer mitigation using medium stochastic and approximate counting algorithm. And this is a combination of uh, something like para and some um, um, counter based mechanism. So it's both probabilistic and deterministic. Uh, interesting. If you want to take a look, you see the archive link down below. 
Uh, I'll flash a bunch of papers from the uh, 2020 to 2024 window. This is going to be a lot of slides. Uh, these are raw hammer, well, papers about raw hammer and reed disturbance. They're published in menus that is uh, where system research, security research, and architecture research usually is published. Uh, this list does not include uh, low level, you know, the um, device level studies on OAM, which also exists. Uh, so you can see in 2020, there's a bunch of papers. 2021, there are more papers. 2022, there are more papers. Uh, one slide can have more than one paper. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I won't give you enough time to parse the slide. Yet. So uh, if you're interested, please go over this uh, slide set. It's uploaded on our portrait page. Uh, in 2022, this is a paper from our group. I won't have time to talk about it, unfortunately. And again, another paper from our group. Um, 2023 is just a lot more papers. The industry solutions came out in 2023. Uh, I think interesting ones I'm trying to spot, the ones that I have not talked about. And very recently, I talked about these two techniques that were published in 2024. And I guess you'll have two more at least in you know, using security. Uh, one is Abacus, the other one is Sledgehammer. It's another show of attack paper. So there's still a new program, attack papers, defense papers, understanding papers, being written. Still an interesting area to um, investigate. And maybe I will talk about one more thing and then I'll conclude. Um, so the question is are we now program free in 2024 and beyond? I think it's quite clear that we're not. But just to make things worse, uh, we also have a new read disturbance phenomenon that we uh, have characterized in real DDR tortures. It's called raw press. It, um, it's amplifying read disturbance in modern DRAM chips. So I'll talk about raw press very quickly. It was published in ISCA 2023. Uh, a high level summary is there is a new read disturbance phenomenon that causes disturbance in real DDR4 chips. And it's different from raw hammer vulnerability, and we show this by experiments. And we demonstrate raw press also using a user level program on a real Intel system. And we provide some effective solutions to raw press. So what is raw press? If you keep a DRAM open for a very long time, it causes bit flips and adjacent rows. Causing bit flips and adjacent rows is similar to raw hammer, but keeping the DRAM open for a long time is the different part. Uh, and the key thing about this phenomenon is that you don't require many row activation factors. Only one activation is enough. If you keep the row open long enough, you will induce bit slips in neighboring rows. Uh, and then uh, I want to skip this slide. This is showing the row hammer bit slips. And then here is exactly. So, why is this important? Because um, these mitigations work by detecting high row activation time. So, they will have a row hammer threshold set. If a row, if, if a row is, has been activated 5,000 times, you will uh, prevent a refresh its vacancy, right? But what if now you could actually uh, induce bit flips by just one activation or 10 or 100 activations? You have essentially increased the overhead of those mitigation techniques significantly. So this is a disturbed phenomenon that doesn't rely on higher activation. Now. And this is a pictorial uh, comparison between a row hammer access pattern and a row press access pattern, you can see that we increase the time that the aggressor row stays open, and we open it only twice in the below diagram. Uh, in, in the row hammer diagram, we open it multiple times, but the aggressor row on time is smaller. So uh, experimentally, on average, if you keep a row open for 36 nanoseconds, you need 47,000 activations to induce bit flips. Whereas if you keep it open for 7.8 microseconds, this is a refresh interval. This is the interval between uh, interval at which you send periodic refresh commands to the DRAM chip. Only 5,000 activations is enough to induce these same bit flips. Well, not the same bit flips, but bit flips. Uh, and, and in an extreme case, only one activation is enough if you can keep it open for 30 milliseconds. That will induce bit flips. This is the what my. Yeah, this is can think of open and close as a high and low voltage. Okay, so we did a DRAM chip characterization study, it has 164 DDR4 chips. Uh, we show that open significantly amplifies the read service vulnerability. 
and a different under, it has a different underlying error mechanism from raw hammer. Uh, I won't go into details of these, so I'll skip this and I'll, I'll go to my conclusion slides, I think. Although there are many more things that, um, that are in these slides, at least. I need to, I guess, conclude. Now, hopefully this will maybe uh, push you towards selecting some Rohan papers for this thing, if it's interesting. Yeah, I think we want to, uh, to architect future memory for security. Uh, we want to have three separate, um, th three separate directions. We want to understand the vulnerabilities like Rohammer. Uh, we want to architect principle architecture with security as a key concern. Uh, not like, I argue we're not like DDR4 TR, right? There, the security is not a key concern. Um, and principle design, automation, and online testing. Uh, now, there are more bridges that have, that have been collapsed. I guess this is, signifies the importance of the, the problem. Right? We have been building bridges for so long, but still we are unable to keep them rigid. Um, so hopefully this won't be the same for DRAM because, um, or for main, main memory or for computing systems, if you think about it, because it also in, impacts the safety, security, and reliability uh, of us, essentially. Like having bad chips is a bad thing. Uh, and tells you memory controllers can avoid such errors. Hopefully you took this uh, as a takeaway from the slides. And um, there's been many, basically there's many, many, a lot of work going on in Rohan and it still has not stopped. And there's no reason for it to stop. So it's an interesting area to uh, work on and there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, these are um, final thoughts on Rohammer from those original slides. Uh, this class of failures is known as Byzantine failures, I think. And uh, these errors are undetected. So undetected erroneous computation happens. And it's opposite of fail fast. Basically, that's what you want from a system that fails. You want to be able to uh, understand that it has failed. Um, but for Rohammer, that's not the case. Your errors will be undetected and you want to do all you can to avoid them. Uh, and this is from, uh, I think this is from, th th this paper by Zen and and Paul explains this uh, error mechanism. Uh, in the past, before Rohammer, there was this paper uh, that Fulzerum would consider, consider beautiful, uh, using memory errors to attack a virtual machine. I agree with them. Uh, basically, uh, the paper says that if the attacker has physical access to the outside of the machine, um, it can do, they can induce memory errors and they attack a Java virtual machine. They take over a virtual machine using this, um, I think, technique, or they get, get out of the virtual machine. I, I don't exactly remember, but they do showcase a proper, a proper uh, system attack. And the setup looks like this so it's just a lamp that uh, turned towards the DRAM module in the system and they inject errors via this technique to take over a virtual machine. Now, after all, Hammer, uh, you now have a simple memory error that can be induced by software. You don't even need the physical access. You only need to be able to run code. And in some cases, I would argue, you only need to be able to send packets to the uh, network type to induce these failures. And that's, I guess, that uh, just signifies the um, uh, the importance of these memory errors now, how easy compared to past it, it's still induced. It. And uh, Rohammer en enabled a new mindset that you need interest in hardware security attack research because now real memory chips are vulnerable and uh, like hardware reliability to security connection is now like a more mainstream since the Rohammer failure mechanism uh, sort of was found to be widespread across all the chips. Um, and there are many new Rohan attacks that comes up in new uh, security conferences or in other venues. And there are more and more Rohan solutions. Uh, and it enabled a shift of mindset in mainstream security researchers because 
um, now they think general purpose hardware, or now we think, or we have more data that shows that general purpose hardware is uh, followable in a widespread manner. Its problems are exploitable. And um, the mindset has enabled many system security researchers uh, to examine these errors or the hardware in more web. And th this, I think, ties well to this last point here. Uh, it says that it's no coincidence that the two groups that discovered Meltdown and Spectre, I don't know if you've heard of it, they're CPU microarchitecture related, well, you could consider them bugs that allow uh, a malicious party to take over a system essentially by running uh, some code. Um, not so specialized code actually, it's usual code. Um, they, these researchers worked on raw hammer attacks before and they arguably they might have gained some deeper understanding of hardware that allowed them to. Uh, or interest in hardware that allow them to find these attacks. Uh, so summary is <laughs> memory reliability gets worse or is reducing and it opens up new security vulnerabilities and safety and reliability and dependability and availability vulnerabilities actually. And the, these are very hard to defend against and Rohammer is a prime example for that. It's the first example of a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability, and we have seen its implications on security research and architecture research, actually. Uh, bad news is it's getting worse with scaling, with technology scaling, uh, but good news is we have a lot more to do. So uh, that's good news, I guess, for researchers, not the general public. Uh, yeah, and for ongoing and future work, I think it's important to so and uh, uh, new bit flips fundamentally fix them. And th this will enable us to build more robust systems for the future. You can read these papers to learn more about Rohammer. And all of the reference papers, talks, artifacts, code, you can find them in these links. And this is a picture of our GitHub page that has all the artifacts of our work. Uh, I guess this is the final picture of Rohammer. And thank you for listening to me so far. Do you have any questions? Does YouTube have any questions? Right. Are you interested in Rohammer? Definitely. Cool. cool. Then uh, I guess we're done. So. Should I turn off the lights?